This is an analysis of William Butler Yeats's poems, The Lake Isle of Innisfree and The Second Coming. Summary of The Lake Isle of Innisfree The poem The Lake Isle of Innisfree begins with the poet declaring that he will rise and go to Innisfree, where he will build a small cabin of clay and wattles, or stakes. There he will have nine bean rows and a beehive, and live alone in the glade, loud with the sound of bees. He says that he will have peace there, for peace drops from the veils of morning to where the cricket sings. He goes on to say that midnight there is a glimmer, and noon is a purple glow, and evening is full of linnet's wings. He declares again that he will arise and go, for always, day and night, he hears the lake wa water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While he stands in the city, on the roadway or on the pavement's gray, he hears the sound within himself in the deeper heart's core. Analysis of the Lake Isle of Innisfree William Butler Yeats's poem, The Lake Isle of Innisfree, is a simple poem in which he describes with nostalgia his hometown near Sligo on a small, small island in western Ireland as beautiful and pastoral in contrast with the dirty and polluted life in London. He was inspired to write the poem when he was feeling homesick in London and heard the trickle of water in a fountain in a shop window which reminded him of the lake water in his hometown. The Lake Isle of Innisfree is one of his first great poems and one of his most enduring. Like William Wordsworth's poetry, the poem emphasizes the beauty and importance of nature and our inner connection to it. The tranquil, hypnotic hexa hexameters, or lines with six stressed syllables, recreate the rhythmic pulse of the tide. The simple imagery of the quiet life the speaker longs to lead, as he describes each of its qualities, lulls the reader into his idyllic fantasy, until he shocks the reader back to the reality of his drab urban existence with the line, while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's gray. He then ends with the line, I hear it in the deep heart's core, emphasizing how important remaining true to his heart's core, or most important values, is to the poet. Summary of The Second Coming The Second Coming opens with the nightmarish scene of a falcon turning in a widening gyre or spiral, and is said that it cannot hear the falconer. Then the speaker announces that things fall apart, the center cannot hold, and mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, along with the frightening description, the blood-dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best people, the speaker says, lack all conviction, but the worst are full of passionate intensity. In the second stanza, which is longer than the first, the speaker states, Surely some revelation is at hand, and surely the second coming is at hand. No sooner does he think of the second coming than he is troubled by a vast image of the spiritus mundi, or the collective spirit of humankind, in which he envisions somewhere in the desert a giant sphinx, or a shape with a lion body and the head of a man, which has a gaze as blank and pitiless as the sun, and is moving while the shadows of desert birds reel about it. The darkness drops again over the speaker's sight, but he knows that the Sphinx's twenty centuries of stony sleep have been made into a nightmare by the motions of a rocking cradle, and what rough beast, he wonders, its hour come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. Analysis of the Second Coming Yeats had a theory about spirals in time that connected the ages of time together. He felt that 2,000 years after the birth of Christ, in the year 2000, the Second Coming of Christ would occur, and this poem is a terrifying image of this time. Christ is depicted as unthinking and uncaring, a beast slouching his way toward the millennium. The second coming of Christ is depicted as an antichrist, the total opposite of Christ. The poem shows the modern age as isolated from our history and culture, in a new terrifying and alienating stage in history void of morals or connection to one another, and controlled by an unthinking, uncaring beast. 
the lines, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, is a famous terrifying image of the apocalypse. This poem is about the second coming of Christ at the turn of the millennium. Naturalistic images of the new millennium as an uncaring beast like the Antichrist coming to change life on earth. It is a very terrifying anti-Christian view of what might happen. Christ is like a sleeping zombie which doesn't care about humanity.